Welcome back. You're still watching The Globe. Now, today marks the 10th anniversary of the passing of Wangari Mathai, who's the Kenyan uh, uh, activist who rose to prominence for her work as a social, environmental and political activist. She's also the first African woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize. A woman of many firsts, Mathai scaled the heights both in her career and what she believed in. She had a great zeal for environmental conservation, which lent to her rubbing shoulders with Kenya's elites. She also endured a fair share of hardship, including getting arrested and facing brutal encounters with the police. In 1977, Matai established the movement to plant trees and improve livelihoods, putting herself at great personal risk to save green public spaces. Uh, through her work, she inspired millions of trees to be planted in Kenya and uh, throughout Africa. Her work helped to, s to slow down deforestation and restore many landscapes across the continent. In 2006, two years after winning the Nobel Peace Prize, she collaborated with the UN Environment to inspire the planting of a billion trees worldwide. She was the first African woman to earn a PhD in veterinary medicine, embodying the idea that one person can be the change that we want to see in the world. Well, we're very fortunate tonight to be joined by Wanjira Mathai, who's the daughter of Nobel Prize laureate Wangari Mathai, to share some of her mother's uh, legacy. And she joins us now via Zoom. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. It's incredible that it, it's been 10 years, um, but I guess uh, for some of us who are remembering her work and her time, uh, for you it must seem like just the other day still. You're so right. I can hardly believe it's 10 years, a whole decade. Um, so much reminds us of her presence and her passion and her compassion. So, yeah, she's, mm. she's very much, it seems like not that long ago. Mm. She was, uh, when we look back now, uh, very much ahead of her time in some of the issues uh, and uh, uh, causes that uh, she fought for. Um, what do you think led her to be that person? What inspired her, uh, I mean, to, to, to fight for conservation in the way that she did when perhaps it, it really wasn't that popular? You're so right. I mean, sometimes I sit down and I remember the things she said about um, the role of nature in cushioning us against the worst impacts. And, and you, you wish she was wrong, right? You wish that it wasn't true that nature would be so harsh and unforgiving if we're not protective and if we're not conscious of protecting it. I think that she was prophetic in many ways uh, in urging us to understand that the, the forests and, and nature overall are our life support systems. And we are seeing that today, the predictions uh, she made many, many years ago coming, to, uh, coming true. So no, she's definitely a great inspiration and her words uh, ring true, as you say, today more than ever. But why, why was she ahead of the curve? Uh, who taught her? Is it something that she just taught herself? Uh, is it stuff that, of tradition that perhaps she modernized? What is it? You know, she attributed it to so many things. She attributed her, her love for the environment to her childhood. The fact that when, when she grew up, she grew up in very beautiful uh, Nyeri County, uh, forested mountains facing Mount Kenya, which was snow-capped and inspired awe. And just the fact that everything around her was so green and beautiful, that was her understanding of beauty. She was also very present to the fact that everything they ate, drank, the water they drank, the animals that were around her, were all a product of the surroundings. The firewood they used in the house to heat the space and cook, the water she fetched, the joy she found as a child from playing in rivers, all of those things. And you project 20 years after that 
particular childhood when she was a scientist, a first PhD in East and Central Africa, her science background connected with that childhood of absolute wonder, I think combined to, to create a very critical uh, thinking human being. And so when she would hear that all the what the rivers that she knew about as a child had disappeared, the trees had been cut down, she was very distressed because she knew with that must have been the destruction mm. of the beautiful nature she saw. That's where it really came from, is a childhood uh, anchored and surrounded by nature. Did your grandparents play a role? Because, you know, educating the girl child again back in those days wasn't something that was a major priority. And yet here we have a woman who excelled in, as you've described, uh, was a first in many areas uh, of academic excellence. Yes, she attributed um, her, her, you know, the good fortune in her life to certainly the men in her life, you know, in particular my brother. If, if you read her book, Unbowed, she tells the story of how, um, as a girl, you're right, she never was slated to go to school and her brothers were going to school and she and her sisters were home. And one day her brother came home and asked, in a very casual way, asked her mother, why doesn't Wangari come to school with us? How come we leave her at home when we go to school? And thank goodness, her mother, um, her mother responded, there is no reason. Uh, and apparently in, in her book, she tells this beautiful story of a conversation going on between her brother and her mother about her. And they're, tr they're talking about why she doesn't go to school. And of course, she has this thirst to go to school. And then at that moment when that conversation is happening and she's eavesdropping, she's sent to fetch water. So she runs down the hill as fast as she can so that she could come back and hear how that story ended. Well, thankfully, that story ended really well because it ended up with her mother saying she should go if you want her. And her brother was very keen that she join him in school. And that was, you know, as they say, the rest is history. But it wasn't always easy. I mean, there were times where it was very yeah. difficult um, uh, coming up against the authorities, getting arrested. Tell us about how she kept going during that time when you know, um, it would have been easier to let it go. You're right. It would have been easier to let it go. And I have to admit, as her children, we often asked her. We were scared uh, for her life. We, we worried about her. And we always used to say, you know, it's not that serious. It's mm. never that serious. And for her, it was that serious. And she felt that um, the green spaces that she was fighting for and the trees that she was protecting were everything and that our lives and, and our children's lives were at stake. And she really believed that. That's really important for people to understand that for her, this was real. This was her real understanding of the fact that without these spaces, without the nature, we would be a history. And now we know that to be true with all the science, all that science is telling us. But she was fortunate, um, I have to say, because of a few important things. One is the solidarity of other women who stood by her. The Greenbelt movement was a movement because it was not just one person. Uh, there were so many good, uh, courageous women just like her who worked with her and walked with her. And then there were just great Samaritans, I call them, people in the clergy, people uh, in different uh, business uh, people, lawyers all over the country who always were at service whenever they were in trouble, um, gave their vehicles, gave their money to make sure that she was safe uh, and offered safekeeping, the diplomatic community. There were so many people. So I would say the solidarity of others. The solidarity of others, so important. And that's another thing I feel today is also important, that we are, we stand in solidarity with those on the front lines. She was a beneficiary of the solidarity of others. How have you been able to carry on her work? Because, uh, I mean, she's left quite a legacy and uh, with a name that you bear, um, there were great expectations, I'm sure. 
Well, fortunately, there are many of us. I think that her legacy is, uh, I, I feel absolutely fortunate to be one of those and to be counted amongst those who carry on her legacy. But the, the legacy lives on in, in, in a number of organizations, the Greenbelt Movement being the one uh, she started and one that continues to inspire the protection of green spaces and trees. We know today, with all the science and climate is telling us the latest science, that nature will be an important part of the climate solution. And so the Greenbelt Movement and its genius model of mobilizing local communities to plant trees will remain a very important legacy and one that we continue to support and propel. Mm -hmm. We also have the Wangari Mathai Foundation, which is inspiring young people. You know, when, when we sat down and thought, what was her message to young people? Africa is a very young continent. The average age, 19 years old. We are the youngest continent in the world. What is her message to those young people? And we felt that it was really important to create platforms that support young people to stand up for what they believe in, to have courage to fight in, in their own spaces and their own activism and to support that and be inspired by that. Mm -hmm. So the foundation is really about inspiring young leadership. And then the Wangari Mathai Institute at the University of Nairobi that is teaching uh, young PhDs and master's students to bridge the gap between what they know about the environment and how they can actually interact as part of their training and learn how to interact with communities. So the, I would say the legacy lives on. We're very proud mm. of that. Do you think that it's becoming more and more um, commonplace, more and more conscious uh, in society to think, to think about the environment, to think green? I remember, I think it was 2020, there was a big issue about a, a fig tree in the middle of Nairobi in the, in the highway. And, and there was quite a lot of activity to try and save the tree and they had to reroute the, 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 the road they were building, if I remember correctly. Absolutely. I think there's a real acknowledgement that trees are crucial. They're, they're monuments and especially that fig tree, if you saw it, it's, it's a, a tree that as a child I grew up seeing and it was a big tree then. It's sort of 100 years old plus. So it just seemed like such a waste to see a tree like that go down mm. to make way for a concrete jungle. So I was really happy to see that that tree was safe. But that tree is but a symbol of what our urban uh, spaces need. We, we cannot continue to plow down trees in, in cities in Africa and put concrete jungles. It's not going to work for our survival. Mm. So we were very happy to see that. But it is entirely uh, uh, the, the young people who, who marched and said no to the destruction of that tree. We tried to fight the, the highway because we felt that the infrastructure is important and Africa needs infrastructure because we do have to go into the 21st century with, with the, all the support that we can get. But we also need to make sure that and to understand that we cannot develop at the expense of the environment. And so we have to do so along with the environment. And we are lucky to have a green city in Nairobi and we hope it stays that way. Your mum uh, was recognized and won many awards uh, in her lifetime. Uh, but I guess the Nobel Peace Prize is quite symbolic I in many ways uh, because it's such a uh, globally recognized and uh, revered award. How did she feel about getting that? And I suppose you as a family uh, must have been very proud. I have to tell you, we were very proud uh, of, of her and of that achievement. The good news and the beauty, I think, is that she never expected it. None of the awards she got were anything she expected. Uh, my mother worked head down, tail up, as they say, and was always surprised when she received an acknowledgement. The Nobel Peace Prize was no different. And she... Um, she really enjoyed, I was so happy that the last 10 years of her life in many ways, or, or I would say seven years of her life, was enjoying the platform that the Nobel Peace Prize created that allowed her to take her message to the world and to inspire others, other young activists and environmentalists like her, 
and that that was an opportunity, especially given the fact, as you mentioned earlier in the program, that it was so difficult for her early. So for, as a family, we were so happy to see her enjoy uh, some goodwill and some uh, good times, in a way, for the, and, and reap the fruits of the, of the work that she had put before. And so many people don't get to see that. They struggle and struggle, but they never really get to see, to enjoy any moment. So those seven years were, were just wonderful. And we know that, uh, you know, for people like her to champion causes in the way that she did often meant sacrificing some family time. So we thank you uh, for giving the world uh, your mother and giving her yeah. the opportunity to, to do great work. And thank you for joining us this evening, uh, for helping us uh, remember her. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. And thank you for remembering her. We miss her dearly, but the legacy lives on in all of us. Asante, Asante Sana. All right, that's Wanjira Mathai who's uh, helping us remember her mother, uh, Wangari Mathai, who uh, died 10.